Good morning, everyone, and, and welcome to our uh, webinar this morning, our plate webinar series this morning. We have Shara Gill from Northwest Florida State College in Niceville, Florida, who's done, Shara's the director of the Advanced Technology and Applied Sciences up there. She's going to talk to us about CNC courses and programs. But first, um, I want to remind some of you and teach some of you, the rest of you, about plate. Uh, plate mission is to drive the workforce manufacturing education and training across the state and make sure that we're the, the best of the best and that we get, make sure that industry gets the talent that they need. All right, thanks. Next. Here's our, our team, Ernie French, who's on the line but driving, so um, we're not making him talk today. Uh, Daniele is on with us also, Manager of Career and Tech Ed, Teresa, who many of you have communicated with, our Community Engagement Manager, and myself, Marilyn Barger, the Senior Education Director. And so we divide our work into kind of three big buckets, curriculum reform and development, student pipeline, and professional development for educators. All of these are important aspects of CTE programs to make sure that um, that they're strong and continuing to support industry. Next. So under student pipeline, we do lots of lots of stuff trying to make sure we um, get some students in their courses, both in the high school feeder programs as well as the two year state college programs. So we promote manufacturing education, work with manufacturing day and month activities. We've developed a manufacturing dashboard with data about educational programs and industry um, uh, online for the state of Florida. We host um, the educator, Manufacturing Educator Awards once a year. It's a great program. Um, publish monthly newsletter and support summer camps and lots of other kinds of um, dissemination activities just to get the word out about manufacturing careers and educate the community and students. And under professional development, um, we do, again, lots of different versions of um, venues for, P for PD. We, we do have a biannual engineering technology forum. The ET forum is held um, twice a year at a different colleges around the state, and the engineering technology educators uh, meet there and talk about issues and new programs, new courses, et cetera. It's a great opportunity to share and collaborate. Um, and some other ways we do that, we have different kinds of workshops from time to time, technical workshops or curriculum workshops. Um, we support some conference attendees, oh. attendees um, and this online uh, webinar series that we're engaged in right now yeah, today. Like... Next, let's see. And here are our um, important websites. You can see plate.org, madeinflorida.org, and our wiki. The wiki has resources for educators, downloadable, lots of downloadable files, lesson plans, um, teaching resources. Made in Florida focuses on careers and information about manufacturing in Florida. And plate, um, I don't know, kind of is our corporate website and tells about what we do and how we do it and where we do it. So. That's it. So I think next is I'm going to turn it over to um, Shara to get started on her presentation of best practices for your CNC course or program. Good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Shara Gill. I am the Director of Advanced Technologies and Applied Sciences here at Northwest Florida State College in the lovely Niceville area. For those who don't know where Niceville is at, it's right above Destin. So we, we see all the, the tourists coming in. All right, uh, next slide, please. So we are here today to discuss CNC uh, courses or best practices. Uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I've had a difficult time filling the void of an instructor, getting my courses done. It's 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 been a task. We've been two years without an instructor. I just hired one. Hopefully he will show up on the 14th of May when he said he was going to show up. So we'll see. Otherwise, I got to restart my uh, search all over again. So a few things that we're going to talk about is what does it take to become a CNC machinist? What are industry looking for? The best practices for students? Certifications, what does that look like for e-learning? Because a lot of us are headed towards e-learning due to the fact of instructors are hard to find. Next slide. 
So becoming a CNC machinist, this journey looks different for everybody. I have seen someone with an art degree receive their AS in fabrication and uh, design, and they love it. The student came to me and she's like, I have this bachelor's degree. I don't know what to do with it. I was like, well, what did you like about the art part of it? You know, and she's like, I like creating and making things. I was like, so we have this and it's a CNC machine program. And I told her, it's like, it's, you're a machinist and you can be an artist with metal. And that resonated really well with her. You know, we as educators uh, shape that journey for our students. And that journey is different for everybody, just like my one student. You know, I got other students come to me. They're like, so I'm in the AA program. I really don't like it. Can I come to your program? Like, well, let's sit down and let's discuss your likes and dislikes and let's see where you, you can kind of fit in at. Next, please. So what's required and desired? Required is a high school education or a GED. That, that's, that's all that is required to become a CNC machinist. However, what is desired is that associate's degree, a certification of some sort. However, a small percentage of machinists hold this. Training, they would love for you to come through the door with an AutoCAD or SolidWorks background of some sort. Um, NIMS training, that looks different for everybody. The instructor that I've hired, he's coming with a background in NIMS, which is great. So I don't have to send him out for training. So we're able to embed that training into it. It's not a requirement. It's just a, a desired trait that some of these uh, industry members are looking for. You know, finding that quality worker is difficult. Many companies are willing to train on site, but would prefer to have incoming employees trained in some way, shape, or form. Very difficult when we do not have instructors. However, if you notice, it says coming to us with some type of background. That background can be e-learning. It can be strictly hands-on. It does look different for everybody. And as you can see, it takes four to five years of training and education to become a machinist. And what they mean by that, because I asked them, I was like, what do y'all mean by that? And they said, four to five years, meaning they can cross train. So they come in and they work on one machine one day, another machine another day, work on this project or that project. So they need to be able to cross train into different platforms of the machines. Next slide, please. So what exactly are our stakeholders you know, looking for? We looked at the desired and required, but what exactly does industry want from us? Next slide, please. So industry is not looking for much other than certifications or education or both. Many of our stakeholders around my area know that if they've graduated from my program, they have been taught soft skills. They have been taught hand tools, problem solving, reading the schematics, and many come out with a lot of certifications. Some believe, and Marilyn mentioned this earlier, some believe that um, there's a gap between industry and education, and that's what our e-team forums do. That's what our state advisory board does here in the state of Florida. We meet together twice a year, and we go over those gaps. It's what does industry want? What does our framework say? How can we marry the two? And that does look differently. Um, so our stakeholders, they want that educational background. They want those certifications. They want it because it also offers them promotions. You know, certifications equals experience and knowing how the machine works. And experience is very hard to come by. So a lot of times when you have that certification in your hand, you're in the door. I always tell my students, you know, if you show up to a job interview at a pizza delivery place, you have your license and this other person does it and you're both interviewing for the same position, who's going to get the job? The one with the license, so the one with the certification. That resonates really well with my students. Next slide, please. So in talking with my, my industry partners, what must our students possess? What? And this is the list they came up with. Math skills, numbers, and measurements. You know, this includes the dexterity of the part, 
and being able to machine the part to almost the exact measurements, if not close, because there's always those tolerances that we teach our students. And of course, technical writing and comprehension skills, schematic readings, complex instructions. Then we have you know, mechanical and technical skills. There's that CAD CAM programs. That is the heart and soul of the machines. Having an individual who is trained on these programs is a win for any company. I know companies who have promoted individuals based on their credentials they hold after graduation and they walk in expecting one job and they come in doing a different job because of those credentials. The next one is teamwork. Must be able to work effectively as a group and not just on their own entity. Yes, while they run the machine by themselves, they still have to be able to, to work as a group because it's not just the part that you're producing, you're producing multiple things and you have to be able to pivot and go and be with a team. And of course, time management. You know, there are multiple steps in a, a CNC machine process and there are often opportunities to make it more efficient. So it's huge when you have multiple projects going on, uh, having machinists come to you who have participated in some type of training program demonstrates that you have time management and, you know you've had to balance that work school life to accomplish a goal of having that certification you know in speaking with my stakeholders soft skills is slowly approaching the top of the list <laughs> i can honestly say from experience um i agree with that recently i was at a recruiting event at a local high school and <laughs> You know, they're standing in front of my table. They're looking at all the, you know, trinkets that I have, you know, little swag stuff. And, of course, our banner in Northwest Florida State College. And I myself and it, I was the ET representative. And then I had my automotive instructor with me promoting his program. And I would say, hi, good morning. And the look of terror came across these students' faces. They were like, oh, she saw me. She's staring at me. She's looking at me. She just spoke to me. Oh, no. You know, I that is something that we deal with. So teaching those soft skills will make them more employable as well. So finding an instructor to incorporate everything is very difficult, but not impossible. Next slide. So what are the best practices for students? And it's not just students, it's your department, it's your educators. What is the best practice for everybody? You're not gonna be able to please everybody. That's, that's the most difficult task ever, but majority can happen. You know, we looked again at the required and desired from industry. So what does that translate into the students? Like what are the pre best practices that we can offer them? Next, please. So what's more beneficial to the students? And we've talked about this at conferences before. Is it in person? Well, it's great but it restricts the learner to in today's workforce. A lot of my adult learners, they already have a job. So being in an in-person class is very difficult. Hybrid works really well for us here in Northwest Florida State College. It's a great combination, but if material's hard to and it's understand, it may take class time away from the lab time. So you can do like some others where they host Zoom uh, in-person classes. And that way you get a, more of an immediate feedback for your students. And then you have, you know, your e-learning. It's great. The lessons can be accessed anywhere, but if there's issues in understanding the material or like what we experienced earlier, technical difficulties, it can delay that. And of course, labs, you know, open, close, how accessible, who mans the lab? Do you have that kind of manpower? The National Institute for Health states that education must be objectively restructured according to sustainability demands to achieve this goal. So many institutes are struggling with enrollment. We, we all know this, we're all really well aware of this. But in speaking with different educators, many have yet to move into the reality of today's world. Our classes need to be flexible. Our labs need to be more than just one set time. Our curriculum needs to meet the demands of our economy. We should be able to pivot and not be stifled by old traditions that do not meet the needs and leave our students in the dark. Um, I have a friend of mine who's attending a different institute. He's in a coding class and he came to me very frustrated. And I was like, what's going on? 
And he said that the material that he's learning is so outdated, he feels like he's learning a bad habit. Now, this student did go to the chair, director, dean, and it was very disheartening what was told to him. It was, well, this is the only instructor that we can afford to teach. He's teaching within the framework. It's just the material's old. He dropped that class. So they lost a potential student. And he actually withdrew from the institution and he's going to go somewhere else. So we got, we got to look at those things as well. You know, getting our classrooms to fit our students' schedules would be more beneficial to not only our ecosystem, but to our students as well. So imagine our students being able to take what they learn in a virtual reality environment and making those costly mistakes there and not in your lab. That's beneficial to everybody. You know, they break the drill bit in the simulation lab, no harm and a foul. They make it inside the lab, the actual physical lab that costs you money. And now I don't know about y'all, but budgets are hard to come by. They really, really are. So having that virtual element uh, enhances that. In, in our world, so we use MSSC. And in a few of their CNC familiarization courses, you can actually program the machine to use G code and M code. There's actually one where it gives you the wrong code. And this is at the very, very end. So they're, they're learning programming. So G code, M code, they're learning what the X, Y, Z axis is due. And at the very end, their very last simulation lab, it throws them an error code. And they actually have to go through and figure out where that error is at and fix it. So not only learning G and M code, they're also learning how to troubleshoot. And all of this is in a simulation lab without even going into a physical lab, touching that CNC machine. This is done in a simulation with MSSC. You know, the students gain those knowledges before touching the machines, which is huge. They, before touching the machine, they're, they're in there, they're learning, and then they have a little bit more confidence going into the actual lab environment. Uh, next slide. Yeah. Sharon, you had a question in the chat. Oh. What software did you say you're using? So we're using MSSC through Amatrol. Correct. G code is a is not a software, but a format for the machine. Yes. So in MSSC, the software that we're using in the simulation lab, they learn how to program the G code and the M code inside the machine. Which trainer, could you elaborate a little bit more? Todd, you can feel free to unmute and ask. Yeah, then I, I, was, I was trying to find that button. Huh? Oh. <laughs> this is I'm at Mulberry High School. Um, we have several pieces of MSSC equipment for mostly AC, DC, um, mm. Mechatronics. We've got the quality trainer and the basic mechanisms trainer. Uh, I've been out to MSSC in Indiana. I was just curious which trainer you're using to teach the G codes uh, simulation. Uh, actually, uh, if you go to the next slide. There it is. So this is an example of what it looks like. So um, over on the left, that's the skill that they're gonna be using. So this is just the familiarization part of it. Um, so they're looking at the buttons, they're learning what the menu does, they're learning everything. And to the right, you can see those G codes and those M codes. And when they get further down into the module, they're able to replace those G and M codes. Um, Teresa, would I be able to share my screen? Yes, you can. Okay, give me one second. I'll log into my MSSC account and show y'all what I'm talking about. Let me move my papers here. <clears throat> the one slide I, you showed really looks awesome. It must be fairly new. I haven't seen that before. It is, it's an update that they've done in MSSC. I absolutely loved it. Um, my students really, enjoyed that lab. Uh, it was a pain in the butt for them. Don't get me wrong. Learning codes is, is difficult for some, but once they got in there and they learned it, they were like, I want to get on the machine now. And it's like, okay, hold up. <laughs> let, 
let's learn this first and then we'll go to the machine. I can't teach the machine. That's not me. It's not my wheelhouse, but um, they, they really enjoyed it. It got them energized and excited about CNC machining. Just like with our uh, ladder logic that we have, they, they love doing the simulation labs like that. You know, this, the new generation, they love games. They absolutely love games. Okay. Good, share good my morning. Good, good morning. morning. Uh, it's just too much to type what I want to <laughs> ask and or say. So my, I'm, I'm Anthony Detroit. I'm an instructor at Eastern Florida State College in the engineering technology department. And I teach the machine shop courses. What do uh, your industry partners say uh, how much value is on conventional machining teaching and understanding G code? What, what are the, what is the people industry saying that, that the importance of that type of knowledge for, for it's, students? It's very important here because we have our military bases that surround us. And so they constantly have contracts where they're having to change code. And they're constantly having to change parts and pieces. So it's very important here that they learn those things. Yeah. So it's I am almost, teaching that. I'm just wondering what, you know, everyone else is experiencing or, or knowing. Yeah, okay. You should come to one of our ET forums. It's really cool. I'm yeah, sorry, you should, go ahead. I said you should come to one of our ET forums. Yeah, I didn't uh, <laughs> have the time. I don't know who, who – I'm the only instructor, so how do I uh, – you know, get someone to sit in my classes. You can actually, uh, you can actually zoom in as well. Instead of physically attending, you can actually zoom in. Okay. They're so informative. Mm -hmm. I've met so many people. We've learned so much from each other, you know, collaborating kind of like what we're doing right now, yeah. you know, learning what everybody else is, is teaching and learning what not to do or this worked over here. It might work here. So it, it's a great, conference to to be able to attend i learn a lot every year thank you the mssc oh, yeah. is a software or it's strictly they program with g-code it is a license and it's a certification so there's four tests that they have to take there's safety um quality practices and measurements manufacturing process and production and then maintenance awareness so they get all four of those certifications. They're full CPT and it's CAPE funded. It's like thousand dollars a head per student. And my get on it within a year. So first semester they take two of those certifications. Second semester they take two and they walk out with their CPT along with whatever other certifications they have, including the OSHA 10 card. Yes, is part of it. I thought you should, are you gonna share that you- I am, it, I am it, about it, to, yeah. You're going through a software program to do some of okay. that. Okay, thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Sorry, I get, all right, let's see, there we are. Yep, share. Can y'all see the screen now? Not yet. It says you've started screen sharing, but it's showing black. You know, the circle. This, on. this is the website that you showed at the ET forum, right? Where you log in and you go, <coughs> is that the same thing that you're so trying to here? Kind of, yeah, okay. kind of. What I could do is record my screen and then share it to y'all. Maybe y'all can pass it out. Would that work? Yes. Okay, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Then I'm sorry, it did not work. We, we'll automatically share the recording and the slides and any other items that share a creates for you guys um, after the webinar. Yeah, I'll get my stuff working. I'll do a little demo on MSSC and then I'll, I'll just send it to you, Teresa. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and do next slide. So e-learning and certifications. <clears throat> Who's doing it? Can we do it? We absolutely can. Uh, next slide, please. So who has moved to e-learning? The biggest two that we have here is Haas and FANUC. Haas, if you look at it, it says, after the online course is completed, a hands-on test at your local Haas factory outlet is required to obtain your certification. FANUC is the same way. FANUC, they'll actually do just an e-learning 
And if you want to do the hands-on, you can, but it just costs extra. I will say this though, in the CNC world, it cannot be all virtual, but it could definitely be hybrid, meaning they get the information online through Zoom, somehow just a learning platform of some sort. And then they come in, they do the lab, they demonstrate what they've learned, and then you can obviously further their skills in there. E-learning cannot replace hands-on training, we know this, but it can teach the basics of all machines before stepping onto that lab floor. Finding experienced machinists is very hard and our knowledgeable machinists are aging out of industry quickly. That includes some of our instructors. I looked at our the people that were retiring. I had a retired CNC machinist living next door to me. I was like, hey, do you want to come? You can add a little extra money, a little bit of this. Nope. They were retired and they were done working. You know, so we as educators need to find the best way to produce workforce ready machinists. And that's going to look different for everybody here for us. It's a hybrid course. They go online, they get the information, they use the simulations, simulation labs, and then they come to us and demonstrate what they've learned. And we further their skills from there. I've actually used workforce instructors to teach my classes to get my kids graduated it was a non-credit class that I was able to articulate into accreditation. So that was another workaround that we did as well. So it was almost like renting out our lab space, but I was able to articulate it that, hey, they did X amount of hours. They did this type of test. They did this, this, this. This articulates into this course and gave them, I was actually able to give them credit for that for a non-credit class. Next slide, please. Are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions on, on how that articulation process? Yes, I have some input on, on two items real quick. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. The uh, In regards to the CPT, the MSSC CPT, in high school, the students require or earn the um, certification there's a statewide articulation that they will receive 15 credits towards their as degree and a lot of the h techs pos educational training centers in the state of florida Pensacola state is one of them we can certify the students with their oral or hands-on certification to haas cnc mill and lathe operator and um there's probably other H techs or other colleges in the state of Florida that have that same opportunity. But the Haas online training is phenomenal when it's tied to hands-on classroom work in the shop. Oh yeah, so the, the National Institute of Health, they actually did a study and they did traditional learners versus hybrid learners. So basically the hybrid learner, they obviously went in person, but they had access to a virtual reality re environment. The ones that were hybrid actually had better standings versus the traditional ones. Now's your opportunity to ask for any specifics or add anything you know that you want to share with the group. Is the uh, Haas training, online training, is that something you've purchased through Haas? Yes. And the actual, the... the actual online training is free. The exam could be a cost for them to get their certification. Yeah, sorry, that was the cost I was talking about. Um, there are other companies that do have it. Um, Cor is it Cor I always mispronounce it. Coursera, Coursera, they have one. Tooling U, they have one as well. 
Um, of course, MSSC has one. Emetrol has them, but I believe one of their simulators is an additional cost, but they do have other ones that are available as well. I had everything pulled up, but I had to take everything off of my computer so we could run Zoom. So MSSC is the one where it had that simulation where you're actually will, like you were looking onto the CNC table with the spindle. Correct. I'm, I'm asking. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That looked cool. I love the simulations that they have in there, especially when we're, te when I'm going through and teaching ACDC and Amatrol, uh, we have the 770 trainers. We also have the ladder logic that's attached to it as well. And so my kids are able to look at a schematic and mimic the schematic in the simulation. So I, I really like that. And they, they do like that too. And then I actually have the physical trainers in my lab. And so when they get there, they know what they're doing. How does everyone get their students to do their homework? That's, that's probably the biggest challenge for me. Um, so I'm an oddball and I'm going to get a lot of frowns when I say this. I don't have homework. Everything gets done in class. Now, if they choose to do simulations outside of class, that is up to them. And they do do the simulations because they like them. And I do project based. So if you choose not to do a project. You have 10 projects throughout the semester. If you choose not to do it, that's your choice. You get what you get at the end, depending on how many projects you finish. This is Todd yeah. again. Um, are you a hybrid or mostly online or mostly physical? You gave that slide with the four different options. Which, which one is typically your program? So for my adult learners, we use hybrid. We have what's we have collegiate here, so college, high school, not dual enrollment. We do have dual enrollment too, but uh, our collegiate high school, meaning the high school is here at the college. I teach them in person. They need that in person because they don't have world experiences to to learn from and bring to class. So there's we're starting from a zero base of everything. So for them, it's an in person. But for my adult learners. Half of it is online and the other half is in person. I'm trying to bring up, cause he said project base and I was gonna show y'all. When you're finished with that, just um, you also had a request in the chat to oh. share the link to the Amatrol CNT trainer. Do y'all have the license to log in? Because you have to have your license to log into the MSSC. I think they need the link to know where to start. They're having trouble Googling oh. what you're looking, what you're talking about. Okay. Yep. Let me. Soon. You know, what's funny is I got a new computer too. And ever since I got the new computer, I can't run Zoom. <laughs> Let me put it in the chat for y'all. Um, there it goes. There you go. It, okay. So that's the direct link. That's, yeah. um, you were showing that at ET Forum when you go to the MSSC USA site, it's under courses. Is that correct? Correct. I wonder if I can copy and paste this in here. So I'm going to send something on the chat. This, hopefully it will go through. Um, can you all see it in the chat? This is one of the simulators where they were doing, it's an introduction to electrical, uh, the electric motor control. So this is kind of one of the simulations. They take a picture of it and they, they post it, which lets us know that they've completed it. And they schedule time with us and go meet us in the lab. And then we they show me what they know. 
and they show me what they've learned. And if there's any questions, I'm right there for them. We do have this thing called Connex ED, where they're able to schedule a time where I'm available or another instructor's available. So we're not having to man the lab 24 seven. It's basically based off of our schedule and their schedule. Um, I do have another instructor coming in, so hopefully our lab hours will extend, but right now it's appointment based only if they need lab, extra lab time. We have a separate webinar that's on demand that was specifically on creating an open lab. So if you don't already have one and you wanna know um, some ideas of how other schools have created an open lab format that's available. This is Todd again. Can you characterize your student demographics? So for our collegiate students, it ranges from ninth graders as in 14 year old ninth graders, uh, all the way up to seniors. And then my adult learners range from about 21 year olds to about 30 something and about 20% is female. Would you characterize your students as affluent or low socioeconomic? I would say maybe 30% are low social economic. We do have, since we're surrounded by base, I do have uh, some active duty folks too and veterans as well. That's probably roughly around the 10% range. Anybody else want to share about your program demographics? Yes, if I could uh, uh, ask a question. Um, I came in a little bit late. I apologize. I thought it was 10 o'clock. Um, I'm having extreme, uh, I'm having very, I'm very successful using Fusion 360 and teaching parametric design, parametric design, applying tool paths, and then students can post code and look at that and revise it and edit it. But also, we're running those projects on real Haas CNC machines as well. Is uh, anyone else in the group using Fusion 360, or are you thinking about applying Fusion 360 to your programs? If you are, I would be willing to share everything I do, you know, from the Panhandle to uh, anyone interested. And they also have a CAPE funded uh, certification available too. So, uh, and also the software is free to all education. Yeah, this, this, this is more to see from Polk State College. Uh, yeah, we do use um, Fusion 360. We used to do SolidWorks, but SolidWorks, as you know, it costs $2,000 a year. Fusion 360 is free. And it's pretty much the same thing. And um, we have had very success uh, stories about using Fusion 360 for our CNC activities. We also use MasterCam. MasterCam is, gives you a lot of better tools. And the students need to become familiar with um, many different types. So MasterCam, I think, is going to be a good option for you guys. And I will be happy to receive any information, Mike, you send us, send it through our way. We'll be happy to use your uh, expertise and your experiences. Yeah, I was a MasterCam trainer, started in 1994, and then I fell out of my chair when I saw what Fusion did. But they're both really good programs. But um, due to the fact that in Fusion, prior to that, MasterCam on, did not allow students to post their designs. They had a, it was a demonstration or a, or a student version only. But uh, with Fusion having the ability where a student can post his program and complete the project, bring it to school and pretty much run it. Yeah. Uh, was a huge transformation of the ability for them to completely, um, 
use the software package. And uh, yeah, it's it's pretty professional. I'm very happy about Fusion 360. Mike, this is Anthony Detroit. We spoke, if you recall, probably uh, towards the end of or middle of last summer. And we, at Eastern Florida State, we had just purchased MasterCam. So uh, you had sent me some, a whole bunch of stuff, which I still appreciate and I'm going through. So uh, thank you for what you've done in the past. I think the word was I bombarded you with data. <laughs> yeah, okay, you may have. Yeah, just starting the program, and there, there's a, so much behind the scenes that's going on. So, yeah, I'm still and don't working forget, on And, and, and don't forget started. about another free resource, which is Titans of CNC Academy. Uh, it's free. Yes. And um, yep. they have tons of educational data to apply. And why not use that curriculum? Um, at the college level, we use it just to complement – our lessons for homework or outside of work. And of course, YouTube is our best buddy as well. Yep. Um, so I'm still working on trying to get, cause right now uh, the machining program is just elective classes. I'm still working on trying to make it its own specialization. And uh, that's been ongoing for this past year. So hopefully there's some progress made this summer. This is uh, Todd Thum at Mulberry High School. We have an academy here where we've combined automotive robotics and engineering together. We think there's pretty good synergy and a lot of cross-pollination where students mm -hmm. working in auto and engineering can learn skills that would help them in fields that are dependent on each other. But uh, we, in the robotics program, we teach Inventor and Fusion 360. And in engineering, we teach SolidWorks and we're adding Fusion 360. Um, the reason we do that is our industry partners ask us to be teaching both Inventor and SolidWorks because they're using it and they want students competent um, leaving high school at doing those. Uh, we're adding Fusion 360 because we also are starting to get those questions about teaching 360 as well. And if I can dovetail off something Miss Gill said, um, like her, we're having problems finding instructors. And, and I'm, for those at the state level, we, we need to start talking seriously about how we can maybe partner with businesses. I mean, for example, in the automotive program, if we could have a tech teacher that maybe not be skilled in auto, but knowledgeable about it, but could work on the fundamentals with the students from the book or from the, from the knowledge base, and then bring in people from industry, from automotive companies and uh, dealerships who could work with the students one or two days a week and give them and then test them out on things. We, we just, this, this, this road we're going down where we cannot offer the just compensation of someone with the skill level that's required to teach these students, it's just not gonna happen. And, and it's getting worse at the college level too. And unless we're going to find a whole bunch of retirees who can't, who don't want to work anymore, it's just not going to happen. And we're going to be turning out students who aren't ready for industry. And you could find competent instructors who get them through the, the coursework, but the physical skills of doing things. Um, you know, I, I, one of the things we do here as part of the engineering program is I want them to be able to go from the computer aided design work to a physical product. So we're teaching them to recycle bottle caps from you know, 20 ounce bottles and such. We're shredding those and the students are designing um, aluminum molds that they, they designed the part Then we're going to try to uh, mill the aluminum. Although I don't have a mill right now that can do aluminum, but we can 3D print resin molds and they're gonna injection mold recycled plastic into those and that's I think that's a soup to nuts kind of a way that a student can show that they've done a lot of the engineering, a lot of the, 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 the manufacturing um, troubleshooting and stuff that's necessary. And they learn a lot along the way by physically doing that. And then when they show up to a college interview or to a, 
job interview, they have a physical thing they can take and deliver and show and talk about what they've done. And you're right, Ms. Gill, we have students that I swear, if they got in front of someone who asked them a question, they would just fall to, to a puddle of <laughs> jelly. They did, yeah, it was quite comical and um, frightening and realistic all at the same time. But I've, I've worked with uh, colleges where I've interviewed and, and I've interviewed students as well. And if you can get them to talk about something they were excited about, it flips them. It, it, they go from not opening up, not sharing anything to it turns them on. And then you can't shut them up. You got to kick them out of here. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Shara, there's a question in the chat, oh. chat about which it sounds, I, if I remember right, several of the programs are free, but some of them have a cost for the exams. Um, the question was, which were the free um, Titan Cam sites or programs mentioned? Can you recap which one? I think Maury said that was it Fusion 360 free? Was MSSC Amatrol free? Um, which things have a cost? Well, when I say, I'm sorry, Cheryl, I jumped in. When I say it's free, it's free to the institution. Um, we used to pay $2,000 for SolidWorks. And uh, for Fusion 360, we pay nothing. For any software that's provided by Autodesk, we don't pay any. Uh, fees. Wow. But because when they are taking exam, they have their exams. So that typically is covered by some part of entities in our college. They jump in and provide that money for the students to take the exam if they pass it. Um, but I was talking about the software being available for uh, educational institutions. Thank you, Maury. Um, Shara also was um, how question in the chat was how to go about getting an activation code for the Amatrol MSS training registration. Yeah, so Todd actually answered it okay. um, as I was typing it. So you um, you contact Mark out of DC, and I'm going to mispronounce it, Jaeger, but they say it differently. That is my Amatrol MSSC uh, rep. So Steve, Mark, Steve, they they both intermingle. I'm sorry, <laughs> they're both at the ET forum. So they are my go-to people. I contact Rod and be like, hey, Gina, I need to re-up my license for, because I teach collegiate, it's um, $1,000 for the license. Okay. This is uh, Anthony Detroit again from Eastern Florida State. So I like for my students to do projects that they can take home and kind of be useful and also for different components, one piece to fit into another. We, we make a salt and pepper shaker. So the salt shaker is round, the pepper shaker is square and they have a salt and pepper shake shaker. And then it shows you, they have to make things, the cap has to be a slip fit. It's not threaded on, it's a slip fit. And then we make a hammer, right? Some traditional old things, but the handle, the hammer, has a press fit into the hole in the head. So they're learning tolerance also and the dimensions have to be held so the things fit right. Does does anyone else have projects that they do that are something along those lines? So we do at North Oswego State College, we have projects as well. We will actually make coins for the college. And that's one of the projects that we do in SolidWorks is they have to design a college coin. I pick the top four. We actually give that out as swag, not only to new hires, but you know, whenever I'm out recruiting events and stuff like that. So we do do that. We resin print them or we'll filament print them. We used to make them in our CNC shop, but like I said, it's been two years since I've had an instructor. So we've not done that in two years, but normally we will do that as well. The collegiate high school, they needed some type of window covering. And so we made it a project base for them to develop this window covering with a little slide mechanism. That way they can see who's at the door and just basically increase security and safety over here. And then there's another project that our old CNC instructor used to do as well. And it was creating card holders for new employees. 
that I had to have some type of mechanism with it. So it wasn't just, you know, oh, here's a, you know, card placeholder. There was actually more to it. I just don't re quite remember what he did. Any other questions or input? Yeah, we've also done the card holders and we also do um, machining of, uh, a big one is bottle openers. I know it sounds kind of, but they go ahead and machine those out and engrave them. And it's a really fun project for the creativity of the student and also learning how to program on the Haas machines. Huh. So like, like a, uh, you know, the, a, yeah, a seven inch yeah. bottle opener. Yeah. And they put, you know, uh, the, the college, you know, emblem on it they put whatever they want and they go through the process and it's 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 one of the introduction program projects i don't know about y'all but project-based learning for us over here is more successful than anything else that we that we've done since i started incorporating project-based learning our students thrive a little more and they're more engaged and they they really do like it they love the hands-on they like the real world experience because i tell them all the time you got a customer coming in or a project coming in and your boss or you have to design, develop, whatever, this is your chance to shine. This is your chance to incorporate what we're teaching you. There was a question. Could I add an input on that as well? Yes, go ahead. Um, if you're looking for project-based projects um, and you don't have the time to develop them, Titans of CNC Academy, and I started out with these years ago. Uh, Titan Build Blocks has 10 designs based off a simple one by two aluminum bar stock that you can order, you know, a common stock, stock size. But they go through the they go through the design and toolpath application and running it on a Tormont mill in SolidWorks, Mastercam and Fusion 360. And it's a good base to consider using to build your own projects. And I've taken some of the designs and developed my own designs that are similar or completely different using a standard one by two billet aluminum stock. Just want to throw that out to you guys. Thank you. Yes, I have seen that, but I just, and the projects are just some shape, you know, it's not something that is useful that uh, they just seem to have a little bit more interest on instead of making some kind of widget. If they're making, let's say the salt and pepper shaker, you know, then, oh, you know, they, they give it to someone, you know, or they use it themselves. And again, I like things, projects where things fit together, where they're trying to hold tolerance also. Well, you can add those. You can add those to the package, and do assemblies and yeah, and mating parts, and boxes with lids, and it's just a basic core foundation. Understood. Showing students how to use the software, apply toolpath, posts, and actually see it run on a machine without having a machine in the lab. If you have the luxury of having a CNC machine, you know, make some parts. They're just widgets. Yep. You're right, but then expand into other designs that that you create, you know, for mating parts and things like that. Yep. It's um, it's a good foundation. Uh, even at the college level, I found very useful. And uh, it's something to start off with. Or Thank you, thank you. Sure. Yeah, may, may, oh, go ahead, Maureen. Yeah, may I suggest one project that um, is pretty interesting. Making a clock and um, marking hours and minutes by two different tools or at the different length and so on. And then you can put these programs for the marking the hours and marking the minutes outside of your main program. And then access rotation on your mill is becomes very interesting. And students learn how to rotate the axis for a certain degree and also go outside of the main program, bring the other program in and execute and go back to main program again. So mm. these sort of activities 
to me it's very interesting the students learn a lot how they can do it and also you make a requirements for the students to make the program as short as possible because you can make a program a thousand lines you also make a program 11 lines this program that i was talking about is only 11 lines so there are so many things that can do in that clock on the back side of that aluminum piece they can create a cavity and then put piece of um, uh, clock they can buy from amazon.com and put it in there and it's going to be functional so they're engraving the numbers of the on the face of the clock yes uh-huh engraving the numbers drilling hole at the center and create a cavity on the back and put the electronic um, clock that you can buy from online and put it in and put the um, handles on the front and it becomes a clock. Very cool. Yeah, thank you. Anybody um, who can stay past 11 is welcome to stay. If you have more to share, I just want to um, wrap up before 11 in case some people have to leave. Since there was so much um, conversation today, I'm when I send the follow-up email with the recording and the slide deck, um, I will CC everybody instead of blind carbon copy, unless some of you would prefer me not to share your email addresses, please tell me. But that way you'll be able to have each other's email addresses in case you had a question for somebody that was here today um, on one of the things that they mentioned. And also you can reply to um, the email that I send if you need a certificate of attendance or want a certificate of attendance um, for today's webinar. Um, I can send that to you. And we wanted to let you know that we have one more webinar coming up on May 7th. Um, and that one um, is on universal programming approach um, for PLCs. And then we also still have a few slots left in our um, FLATE 2024 Summer Teacher Institute, which will be held June 10th through 14th at Hillsborough Community College. And yeah. um, all of our, I mentioned some of these on the call today, all of our past webinars um, are available on demand. So if you missed one that's helpful to you, um, you can access those as well. And we'll um, share this whole slide deck with Shara's information and ours. Um, and um, thank you so much for coming today. And anybody who wants to stay on and continue to talk, um, feel free to do so.